for our lives. If you're willing to put up a flyer, please raise your hand. If you're willing to put one up at the library or uh, your grocery store or taxi, we'll pass you a flyer. I've heard nine or ten of them. Let me honest email to you. But I think this is important to get the word out to show that there are people in Grand Junction who care and want to be part of the solution. We can never give up hope to restore God's sanity. A good thing in sanity we have in our country. In other announcements, Wednesday is through the New Testament Bible study at 1, and Michigan Outreach will meet at 2 o'clock.
photograph to kind of get a picture of us from this direction because I have a different picture. I see everyone's face with orange, and that's beautiful. It's a little different picture if you take it from the back. So can we get a picture? Now say cheese. <laughs> In terms of concerns, oh, we could almost wear ours every week now, couldn't we? The most recent shooting on this murder with guns was in Tulsa. And I know St. I know St. Francis Hospital very well. I've done hundreds of hospitals since there when I was a minister in Tulsa for nine years. And I also knew the doctor. He wasn't my doctor, but I knew him because anyone here a WNBA fan? Anyone here? Because I went to uh, WNBA games when Tulsa had a team, and he was the team doctor. So he was in every game, and he was well known and well loved. And so this is a heartbreak for the entire Tulsa community and WNBA fans and those who just knew him. And uh, the difficulty with that surgery is that it is a 50-50 chance of improvement. And this person expressed their sadness and disappointment with guns, not with words. And we pray for our society to find a better way. Peace to the so on. Other people who wish to share a joy or concern in the community, please come forward. We've got room right here in front of you. But, uh, please come forward. Right, Bruce? I'm not sure where I'm going to but come on. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Bruce. And uh, I would like to ask you, I see a number of people out here without masks on. Please, if you're going to err on the side of caution and wear your masks. I know that's a terrible subject. But who can err? It's a good subject. Uh, I have to with the Reverend, I, I spoke with Senator Scott with the Ship of the Memorial Service. We were talking about the comprehensive ed class, such a class that the school district is going to be Our law, is not a good our, our law is not lawful, but I have to let you take a look at you and he said he would. And I got a brand new reporter from KR Reaction to on the channel and does his name is Mr. Sapp. And the other, the other thing I'm going to tell you about is please, if you have violence incidences, if you see anything unusual and you need, we need, you four one stop and report it. Okay, the other thing is there happen some problems uh, with this. Meeting. And we were having some problems. I thought we had a, 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 a federal ruling on the fact that these, these individuals are allowed to camp. If there is no shelter available, they are allowed to camp. Apparently, they went in and destroyed one of the camps. All they put in there and they people out. Now, there has to be some kind of. I spoke with an individual, a uh, major uh, at the police department, he and I came to the conclusion that he wanted site specific control if they had some specific, specific place for these people. Like what the park would be an excellent place for. But the point being there is uh, all of a sudden we're having some communication issues as to why these people are not allowed to be what they stated they should be a lawfully could do. And I hope they did it for you. Oh,
Um, you can also donate online by going to our website and looking for the Strength of the Church drop box. And um, so just uh, keep in mind that giving to this um, special offering is indeed um, prayer in action. Thank you. Because of our love for the divine giver, we seek ways to share our love through our treasures, talents, and time. Whether we give in this hour or throughout the week, we may remember that God's spirit encircles those gifts with hope.
Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. <coughs> Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here is the reading of the lesson. Jewish path as a path 
valid covenant with God. Meaning, it is not our job to convert Jewish people. That their connection to God is valid in and of itself. It's acknowledging that their cup also has the living water of God's spirit. And it's a spiritual breakthrough to realize that more than one cup is filled with God's spirit in our world. It's amazing grace to experience for the first time that God's presence is found in people of other faiths and identities. You know, I was raised to believe that God's Spirit only showed up about 1,980 years ago on this day we call Pentecost. And that's what I was taught growing up in the Methodist Church with a wonderful, gentle, caring Sunday school teacher named Mrs. Steve. Just a great soul. Had more influence on me than any minister growing up. Her love, her light, guided me. Now, on Pentecost, Mrs. Steve shared the story on something that was sort of the DVD of the 1960s. It was a strange thing called a flannel graph board. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those things? Have you ever touched those things or teach with those things? So I remember Pentecost quite well because as a kid, certain images capture your imagination. And I remember there were the disciples who put them on the flannel board, and you know, there they were with their bathrobes and long beards, and they were sitting, waiting for the Spirit, and then Mrs. Steve pulled out something, and she put the fire on top of each of their heads. Every one of their hair was on fire, and I had never seen that happen in the Methodist Church. <laughs> Though I tell you, I think some of the blue hair we had in the 60s would have gone up and burned the tree. Now, what the Sunday school curriculum failed to acknowledge was that God's spirit did not just pop into existence 1,980 years ago. One of the confusions we have is that the spirit only works in Christians, and that's a confusion we can outgrow in the United Church of Christ and in the world. Another confusion we have is that the spirit first appeared and was unique to Pentecost. It was not. Go back and look at the Hebrew stories, the Jewish stories. In Genesis, chapter 1, verse 2, it's the Spirit that's hovering over creation, sort of molding things like an artist. So the Spirit was there even before time, before matter, before existence. And apart from the Spirit, none of us would be here. It was the molder of life. And creation. Anyone here an artist? I told you I was going to ask that question. And I'm going to define art as expressing creativity. And that creativity can be sewing, or knitting, or painting, or drawing, or doodling on your college textbooks, or anything that's creating. It can be with words, poetry, it can be with thoughts. Anyone here an artist? We all are. Now here's the good and shocking news. If you read the Bible and you start from the beginning, the very first person filled with the Spirit was not a minister, was not a priest, was not a prophet. The very first person filled with the Spirit was not a king or leader. The very first person in the Bible filled with the Spirit is someone I bet you've never heard of. You have to look at Exodus chapter 31. You can do that when you get home. Exodus chapter 31. The first person filled with the Spirit of God in the Bible is an artist named Bezel El. An artist named Bezel El whose job was to create the beautiful art for the Ark of the Covenant. So God sent the Spirit to inspire this artist to create something that would hold the Ten Commandments. So if you think that ministers or priests have a monopoly on the Spirit, no! First one's filled, artists. 
So if anyone gets the spirit first, it's people who are creative looking for the visions of God within our society. So if you're an artist, remember you have a special privilege in your creations, even if you don't consider them art. And then in Numbers chapter 11, the spirit is given to 70 Jewish leaders who have the job of managing all of the 12 tribes. So the second people who get the spirit are not priests or ministers. They're born administrators. Administrators who need wisdom in dealing with how to restructure society. The Pentecost experience comes to those 70 Jewish elders. In Deuteronomy, the spirit fills Joshua and as a result of filling Joshua, he receives wisdom and insight. So the Spirit comes and works in every human being differently. Now this is a sign that you see different people have different gifts. In Judges chapter 6, the Spirit came upon Gideon and helped him in a battle with false prophets. Gave him the strength he needed. If we want to remember strength, you look where the Spirit came in Judges, in three different chapters, the Spirit came upon the old He-Man in the Old Testament, Samson. His strength was said to be a gift that came upon him through the Spirit. So even physical strength. Then we have, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, the Spirit comes upon King Saul and he begins to dance and shout and say. So the very first Pentecostal wasn't in 1907. The very first Pentecostal was King Saul way back, 2000 BC. In 1 Samuel, the Spirit comes upon King David. And then the prophets all were manifestations of the Spirit of God. In Isaiah, hear these words that Isaiah said about himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to announce the release of the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you remember anyone else saying that or quoting that? It was a quote that Jesus used to describe his own ministry, following in the steps of the great Hebrew prophet, Isaiah. Today we read the story of Pentecost. And once again, it's not something that simply was 1980 years ago. Peter, when explaining the Spirit of God coming upon the church, cited the prophet Joel, who in chapter 2 said, God will pour out the Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will proclaim God's word. Old men will have dreams. Your young will see visions. And God will pour out God's spirit even on his servants of men and women. And if we look even further back, I think the first outpouring of the spirit that we have in any form of written language is actually in the Vedas in India, which would have been about 5,500 years ago. So the Spirit of God has been pouring out ever since the dawn of creation. And the Spirit is at work if we are open to that Spirit. It's easy to be indifferent, particularly when we're bombarded with the news. It's easy even to be indifferent about gun control when it's so hard to get anything done. The Spirit reminds us of our connection to the victims, to those who are hurting. The Spirit gives us that sense of empathy. The Spirit is sometimes that which you ever feel a tingle down the back of your spine and wonder what's that about when you're watching news that is either delightful or horrible. That is the Spirit in our very wiring, in our awareness, in our conscience, in our heart, in our reflection. Each day is a day of 
Pentecost if we are open to the Spirit of God. Because Pentecost is simply a celebration of a deep spiritual breakthrough. If you go to seminary, you learn that it's sort of the reversal of a story called the Tower of Babel. In the story of the Tower of Babel, everyone spoke one language and they were working together with great pride and great arrogance. And after the tower was destroyed, different people spoke different languages and spread across the world. It was basically what you would call a tribal story that was told around the campfire when children would come up and ask grandpa or grandma, grandpa, grandma, why do people speak different languages? A long time ago, once upon a time, there was this tower when everyone spoke the same language and after the tower was destroyed, they went to different lands and developed different tongues. So Pentecost, we had this odd experience where people from different countries gather in Jerusalem and they hear the message in their own language. It is a reversal story. From the Tower of Babel, once again we're finding instead of diversity with difference and conflict, we're finding diversity with unity and love and compassion and cooperation. That's beautiful. One of the leading scholars of comparative religion, William Campbell Smith, declared, it's an important step to recognize the faith of other people. The next step is to realize there are no other people. <laughs> As humans, we can be very tribal. Reinhold Niebuhr argued that our tribalism is the source of cruelty and injustice. It's natural to justify acts of violence towards those we would classify or label as the other, or the outside, or the foreigner. Human tribalism would love only those people who are exactly like us. And if they're not exactly like us, then the urge is to push them back into the closet, into the ghetto, or into the real brand. Whereas the Spirit calls us to unity, to love, to connection, to oneness, to see the one human race that we are all part of. Sometimes I think the only solution we'll have to all of the hate and difference and tribalism we have on this earth, sometimes I think the only thing that's going to work is an alien visiting. Because an alien visiting this earth would immediately recognize that human beings are the same thing DNA-wise and otherwise, and just have different shades. An alien visit would also cause human beings to look and say, oh, uh, everyone on Earth, we're, we're kind of on the same team. And that's a different team, and we hope they're friendly. But sometimes I think it would take something that dramatic just to wake us up to the truth of genetics. I may have watched the show on PBS where they trace the person's ancestry back for generations. And it's beautiful because what you often find is that no one's like 100% anything. Have you noticed that? They're all a mixture of many, many things. How many have done your DNA family tree test? <laughs> and the interesting thing that comes back is that, you know, you have percentages you did not realize. 4% Norwegian. Now, where the heck did that come from? So, all of these things tell us that our ancestors crossed many boundaries. We're in many places. And if we go back far enough, I'm sometimes asked, are you related to an Ashby who works at the newspaper? Are you related to this other Ashby in town? I'm like, if we go back far enough, we're all related. And if we go back really far, we are all sub-Saharan Africans. Look at the study at Cambridge University. We are all ancestors come from sub-Saharan Africa. Everyone else knows. That awakening shows us the incredible ignorance of racism. Pentecost is trying to teach us the same truth that the Spirit of God does not discriminate. 
but calls us and speaks to us in every language across this world. Native Americans had a far more expansive theology than the original Puritan and Pilgrim congregations. Native Americans saw that there was one great spirit who created the cosmos and all living beings within the cosmos. And Native Americans also had that capacity like Rumi to love the cup less and the water more. If you go back in American history, Native Americans, in terms of the spirit, realized that we are all part and children of the one great spirit. In spite of our differences, in spite of our conflicts, in spite of our disputes. And that is the wisdom that Pentecost tries to communicate to us. And in honesty, it's not an original message. You can find that same message in the Upanishads of the Hindu faith. You can find it in Mahayana, Buddhist texts and sutras. You can find it in the best of Islam expressed through Sufi Muslim sense of unity. You can find it among our Jewish brothers and sisters in their understanding of God's creation. <laughs> so when we think of Pentecost and the beautiful cup we have, let us acknowledge it is one beautiful cup among many. Amen. Before they buy by the armor, before they purchase 1800. 
300 rounds of bullets. So in our own struggles in life, let us pray for the Spirit to work within us to bring healing and wholeness. On the night of the Passover meal, after Jesus had given thanks, he took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body. Broken for you. Take and eat. That same night, he took the cup and he said, This is the covenant of new beginnings. Drink and remember me. Let us enter into prayer together. Loving God, amid the news that disrupts our peace, it reminds us of places we have been and people we have met. Help us to see the deeper truth that we are all part of one family on this earth. Help us to live out not simply the dream of that, but the reality of our connection. And help us to experience the Pentecost of simply saying, Thy will be done within our life, within our hearts, within our communities. Amen. Let us come and celebrate together.
lovers around us. 